Hi, I'm actor Ian Champion, and welcome to History of Horror Cinema, my podcast series devoted to the good, bad, and the ugly of horror movie history. Please don't forget to like what you hear and hit subscribe. I have such sights to show you. Spooks, 1953. Into the 1950s, the Three Stooges producer-director Jules White was working at maximum efficiency on their behalf, at least in terms of quantity rather than quality. Reputedly, he could even cobble together an entire short film in just one day, by brazenly cannibalizing footage from other films and then shooting connective scenes, often featuring the same actors, studio sets and costumes to cover the gaps. As one might imagine, this only leads to impressive output numbers, indicating a dearth of decent material, which will become glaringly apparent when we get to creeps. Before we arrive at that final horror comedy of the team, White did occasionally make an entire film from scratch, and in the case of 1953's Spooks, he had a very good reason. 1953 was the year that the 3D format became a big box office craze, Edwin H. Land's particular version of 3D, or stereoscopic vision to be exact, was pioneered back in 1929 as an invention to dim overly bright car headlights. It used a layer of filtering crystals that only allowed certain light waves to pass through. He discovered that his technique could also create three-dimensional film images by superimposing two images onto the same screen via separate polarizing filters and displayed by two projectors. Special eyeglasses featured two subtly different polarizing filters that gave the viewer a slightly varying perspective on the scene through each eye, which appears to give what's on the screen the impression of depth and solid form. When 3D took off in the 1950s, films were either made in this process or filmed using the alternate natural vision method. The timing for 3D exploitation seemed perfect, as cinema attendances were gradually being eroded by home television entertainment and the Hollywood antitrust case of 1948, United States vs. Paramount Pictures Incorporated, that broke the monopoly stranglehold of distribution by the major Hollywood studios, ordering them to divest themselves of their cinema ownerships that forced guaranteed block bookings of their products around the country. The first color feature 3D release to start the 1950s bandwagon was Buana Devil in November 1952, a man-eating lion adventure with the sensational tagline, A Lion in Your Lap. 1953 was the banner year for the new form. The Three Stooges studio Columbia got on board early with the stereoscopic film noir Man in the Dark. Later in April, Vincent Price's World of Mannequins burned splendidly in glorious 3D color pioneering stereo sound as well, in Warner Brothers' House of Wax, followed in May by battling cowboys and Indians spilling out into our popcorn in the siege western Fort Ty, directed by the master of cinema gimmicks William Castle. Jules White saw a rising tide of quick profit, and quickly rushed into production the world's first 3D comedy short, Spooks, releasing it just a few weeks after this. Spooks may have broken new ground in comedy presentation, but the content by now was largely old hat. Although White doesn't recycle footage, he and the Ghost Talks writer Felix Adler contend themselves with reusing Stooges' plots instead, albeit starting with the team in a lineup thrusting their disembodied bonces into the audience's faces. The boys begin as partners in the Super Sleuth Detective Agency, whose cynical advertising raises a smirk. Divorce evidence manufactured to your order. For some macabre reason, their wall boasts an impressive display of medieval torture implements. Into the office comes George B. Bopper, a panicking father whose daughter has been missing for 26 hours. The Stooges whip up their doorstep pie giveaway ruse to scope out neighborhood houses for clues. Their first home visit is a spooky domicile indicated by ghostly sighing wind on the soundtrack. Here is where the guys begin to make use of the stereoscopic in their slapstick, and once they start, it sets off a deluge of point-of-view gags. Mo gives Shemp, or rather us, a two-fingered eye pop, which noticeably slows down the comic timing. In the meantime, inside the house, there's another caged man in a gorilla suit, Steve Calvert, imprisoned by a mad scientist who is yet another graduate of that medical degree mill, the Van Dyke Beard and Glasses School of Medicine. This is Philip Van Zandt, whose huge credit list included earlier better times such as Mr. Ralston in Wells' Citizen Kane in 1941. 
Likewise, Tom Kennedy, whose characterful pugilist face as his lumbering manservant earned him over 300 screen appearances elsewhere, alongside comedy greats like the Marx Brothers and Laurel and Hardy. They have abducted the lovely Mary Bopper, Norma Randall, in order to brain-swap her with said ape, name-checked Congo after MGM's 1932 jungle horror movie. I wasn't kidding when I referenced the over-enthusiastic use of the new technology in this short. From here on, engaged in pitch battle with the scientist, a torrent of 3D tools are thrown as if it was going out of style, which within a year it would be. A greater lethal arsenal is launched at our point of view than in Friday the 13th Part 3. I counted a hypodermic needle, knife, hatchet, scythe, a flamethrower, a water-based extinguisher, and a pitchfork. Take that, Jason Voorhees! And that's just the adult instruments. Two moments in the melee are interestingly rare, whereby Larry takes Moe's place in beating up on Shemp for a change, who is, come to think of it, markedly more submissive toward his basin-cut bro than in the days of the ghost talks. As pies are recruited for the flinging, Moe learns that the white-coated whack job is named after Stevenson's famous schizoid. Dr. Jekyll, we must hide! That gag is worth a flan in the face, and by the end of the movie, everyone gets one, including us in more ways than one. Though it was shot in 3D, Spooks is a one-dimensional retread of the Stooges' back catalogue, enlivened only by the crude novelty of in-your-face slapstick. Jules White hastily assembled a second stereoscopic cash-in for the boys, Pardon My Back Fire, which came out in August. By 1954, 3D was no longer all the rage. Hitchcock's Dial M for Murder was released this way, and The Creature from the Black Lagoon did well enough in the pool to spawn one of its two sequels, Revenge of the Creature, in 1955 in 3D, yet it proved a brief phenomenon. From a high point of over 5,000 cinemas projecting in the format, the demand dwindled partly due to sheer economic inviability. Cinemas had to customize their projectors and pay extra for the two screening prints necessary. Meanwhile, ever on the lookout for the next big thing to tempt Joe Public from their couches, the new widescreen vistas of Cinerama, Fox's Cinemascope, and Paramount's short-lived VistaVision took off, granting viewers a broader canvas requiring less hardware. Spectacle without spectacles. Incidentally, for technical buffs, Spooks took advantage of widescreen development too as it was the first of their series to be shot using the more cinematic 185 to 1 Columbia House ratio instead of the usual squarer Academy ratio of 135 to 1. Creeps, 1956 As mentioned earlier, for their declining years with Columbia, the Three Stooges producer-director Jules White released new films reusing earlier scenes with crude obviousness to fulfill his quota. In the case of their last horror-comedy combination, Creeps, in 1956, the recycling transplanted roughly two-thirds of the entire scenes from 1949's The Ghost Talks, book-ended by new footage and a little cunning redubbing. The premise for returning us to that haunted house this time is that now the trio have three children, themselves in baby outfits, who are as quarrelsome and violent as their parents. The only humorous aspect is Moe's disturbing enthusiasm for a bedtime story with a lot of killings and a lot of murders in it, so we can sleep real good. To pacify this ugly brood, their parents recall their time as removal men. There's no need to revisit the plot except where it differs from the original film. In this version, the Lady Godiva peeping Tom subplot is cut out. The possessed suit of armour has new lines voiced by Phil Arnold, identifying himself as Sir Tom, a brave knight afraid of unscrupulous antique dealers selling him off. The Stooges, of course, ignore his appeal to their cost when the suit defends itself with a sword, running riot and slicing into Moe's trousers as he cowers in fear. There is another new scene intercut where Shemp almost gets it in the neck from a guillotine. Back in the kiddies' bedroom, they still won't sleep after this story, so what do their dads do? They pull out hammers and hit their kids with them, reusing the three NBC chimes audio gag. Although this reads like a British Board of Film Classification transcript of cuts and a 1980s British video nasty, fortunately this is pure slapstick, although you could extrapolate future serial killer possibilities from such an upbringing. A more troubling real-life postscript was that after shooting in this period for the following year's releases, on November the 22nd, 1955, 
the Three Stooges lineup suffered another tragedy when Shemp Howard died of a heart attack coming home in a cab from a boxing match. As I have covered earlier, he had only agreed to fill in temporarily for the ailing Curly with some initial reluctance, but had stayed loyally with the boys for eight years and 76 of their shorts. The kinder option to disband their act after 21 years of gradually lowering standards was not open to them, since they still owed Columbia four more shorts from their contract with Shemp. They had to find a replacement to at least cover for his absence, which led to the recruiting of fake Shemp, actor Joe Palmer, who doubled as the real Shemp, filmed from the back to complete films such as Rumpus in the Harem and Commotion on the Ocean. The Three Stooges were far from finished, though. Seeking a permanent third stooge, they even considered Manton Moreland, who made Monogram slapdash King of the Zombies tolerable. His energy combined with the ethnic diversity would have made interesting refreshment, but the studio insisted on an in-house contracted artist. They settled for Joe Besser, with whom they made another 16 shorts for Columbia. These proved to be the death knell for the brand in their current form. After the Stooges' contract failed to be renewed in 1957, they appeared to be all washed up. It was the expanding television medium, that perceived threat to cinema, that ironically gave the Stooges a new lease of life the following year, being a natural home for small-scale comedy and a secondary outlet for the vast stockpile of 190 shorts in the Columbia vault. TV saved many an aging and flailing comedy act, such as Abbott and Costello, and for the Stooges, the new audience of children reactivated their live appeal. To capitalize on the new demand, they recruited Joe Dorita, whose head was close-cropped to resemble more the hugely popular Curly, and thus his new moniker became Curly Joe. Throughout the 1960s, the Three Stooges remade themselves as big box office live performers, and this revitalized appeal spun into a series of features, such as the Three Stooges in Orbit in 1962, cameoing in It's a Mad 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 World, 1963, and that same year in Sinatra and Martin's quasi-Rat Pack Western comedy Four for Texas. In 1965, they were able to cover their advancing age by filming color slapstick sequences to boost the animated The New Three Stooges, while lending their voices to the characters. By 1969, they were filming for Kook's Tour, a proposed series of international travelogue-based sitcom shows. However, Larry suffered the first of three incapacitating strokes, passing away in January 1975. Moe joined him in March, a victim of lung cancer followed by Joe Besser in March 1988 and Joe Dorita in 1993. Though their comedy horror films were mostly shot during their downward slide in quality, the Three Stooges have retained a lasting screen immortality as one of the greatest comedy teams, allowing their best work to be constantly played on American TV and for home collectors on DVD. Thanks for listening, and if you like what you've just heard, don't forget to click so, and please hit subscribe. If you build it, they will come.